Hey everybody, before this video starts, I just want to let you all know that my new series, Messed Up Murders, will be premiering next week, so make sure to keep an eye out for it so you can watch it as soon as it's live. Oh, and also this week's video is brought to you by Squarespace. <laughs> What is going on freaks and geeks? My name is John Solo and this is a very special episode of Messed Up Origins and that's because today we're talking about the story that started this whole series and became my most viewed video of all time, The Little Mermaid. It has been a very long time since we talked about Ariel and the horrifying story that inspired her, but I can explain why I put it off until now. For one, there's no way I'm going to find better clickbait than that. Two, like I said, it's my most viewed video ever and I just felt like if I made a part two, it would always live in the shadow of the first one and for some reason reason that mattered to me. In three, I just straight up didn't realize how much deeper I could have gone in my research. I mean, yeah, I broke down Anderson's story and drew some connections to the movie, but there was so much left on the table. Like the fact that the mermaid was meant to represent Anderson himself, that her story may have been an allegory for his secret romantic relationship with another man. In my personal favorite, how some folklore say we should see this story as one of woman empowerment instead of oppression. Those are the ideas that we'll be exploring today, but first we got to do a recap of Disney's version of the tale so it's fresh in all of your heads, and of course, unpack Anderson's rendition. Before we get started, make sure you serenade that like button while staring passionately into its eyes, subscribe to have more content like this plopped into your sub box every week, and now let's dive into the messed up origins of The Little Mermaid. So the Disney movie follows a 16-year-old mermaid princess who's bored with life in the underwater kingdom her father rules and is curious about the human world. One night, she saves a prince named Eric from drowning, and that's all it takes for her to fall in love with him. Now that she knows there's a gorgeous hunk of a man up there, she's willing to try any means necessary to get a taste of that sweet bipedal life. So she makes a deal with a sea witch named Ursula, where in exchange for her voice, she gets a brand new set of legs. Ursula also tells her that she has three days to receive the kiss of true love from Prince Eric and stay human, but if she fails, she'll be turned into a polyp and the sea witch will own her forever. It's definitely not the most fair deal, but when Ariel gets to land, things actually end up going pretty great. That kiss from Eric seems right over the horizon until Ursula decides to cheat her own way to the prince's heart by disguising herself as a human. Luckily, Ariel and company are able to interrupt their wedding ceremony before the two say their I do's and she reveals the truth about Ursula, which in turn makes her pretty mad. Unfortunately though, mad does not mean stab proof and the sea witch ends up being slain by Eric and Zeus apparently and he and Ariel get to live happily ever after. Without a doubt, one of my favorite Disney films of all time, and it's the movie that kickstarted the Disney Renaissance and brought us all of these masterpieces, so it deserves every bit of love that it gets. Now, as excellent as this movie is, it takes quite a few creative liberties with the original plot. As you're gonna see, the basic story is generally the same, but the themes, morals, and especially the ending are very different. So Anderson's Little Mermaid, which he released as part of a collection in 1837, has a pretty similar opening to the movie. The reader is introduced to the kingdom where the mermaids live, the widowed king and his six beautiful daughters, the youngest of whom is our protagonist. In the movie, she's the youngest of seven, but close enough, right? Right away, we're told that the little mermaid, who I'm just gonna call Ariel because she doesn't actually have a name in this story and Ariel is way easier to say, is obsessed with the human world. An interesting difference with the Disney protagonist though is that this Ariel doesn't actually care about collecting artifacts from shipwrecks. That's her sisters. Instead, she cared for nothing but her garden of red flowers, which she arranged to look like the sun, and a statue of a handsome young lad carved out of white marble. Any of that sound familiar? Now, also like the movie, part of Ariel's infatuation with humans comes from a character who tells her all kinds of stories about life on the surface. Only instead of a seagull, it's her grandmother, and she actually knows what she's talking about. It's a dingle hopper. Yeah, that's a fork scuttle. What makes Ariel's curiosity so unbearable though is that she isn't even allowed to stick her head above water until she's 15 years old and at this point she's only 10. As a result she has to endure stories from her older sisters who all get to make the journey before her for the next five years. And a weird detail to go along with that, during rainstorms her sisters would approach ships they knew were going to sink and would sing to the sailors about the joys of underwater living so they wouldn't be afraid of drowning. I mean it sounds like they had good intentions but obviously humans can't live underwater so from the sailors perspective, a voice beckoning them to the ocean deep would be pretty creepy. Now eventually Ariel turns 15 and her first visit to the surface plays out almost exactly the same as the scene in the movie where Ariel sees Eric for the first time. She sees a giant ship, a bunch of humans partying on it, fireworks exploding in the sky, and of course the handsome prince whose birthday is the reason for the celebration. Aw, their birthdays are the same day. Isn't that cute? 
Suddenly a storm comes and the ship and all the people on it are devoured by the waves. Luckily for the prince, he's thrown overboard and the mermaid takes his unconscious body to the shore, saving his life. Soon after this, Ariel gets curious about what would have happened to the prince if she didn't save him, so she asks her grandma if humans can die like mermaids can. And despite not being in the movie, the answer is very important to the story, so you're gonna wanna pay attention. Her grandma tells her that even though mermaids can live up to 300 years, they don't have immortal souls like humans do. Instead of ascending to the world above the stars when they die, they simply dissolve into sea foam and cease to exist any longer. Pretty morbid, I know, but there is a workaround. If a mermaid can get a human to love her and marry her, she'll be given a soul of her own. So you're telling me there's a chance. A few nights later, the mermaids have a celebration in the castle ballroom that kind of mirrors the performance in the beginning of the movie, except Ariel is actually there. Physically there, not mentally. Despite an excellent performance on her part, she was thinking about life above water the entire time. Similar to how in the film she missed the concert because she was indulging in her devious hobby. Here is where the story starts to really pick up steam. Ariel goes to the domain of the sea witch in the hopes that she can help her become human, but there's a reason that she's called the sea witch and not a sea fairy godmother. The witch actually plays a much smaller role in this version. Version, she's much more of a neutral enabler as opposed to a full-on antagonist, but her lair strongly resembles Ursula's complete with traumatized polyps. She even has pet sea worms that she calls chickens, similar to how Ursula calls Flotsam and Jetsam her babies and poopsies. Babies. <laughs> My poor little poopsies. Her house is also built with the bones of humans, similar to the famous Russian witch, Baba Yaga. So Ariel should have known this was a bad idea. Between no signifiers and the witch calling her wish stupid right to her face, you would think she would have pulled back a bit, but nah. And if you think the terms of their agreement in the movie was bad, wait until you get a load of this. She's given a potion that will give her human legs, but the transformation of her tail will feel like a sword is passing through her. And every step she takes will feel like she's walking on knives and her feet will bleed. Interesting fact, Anderson often located suffering in the feet of his protagonists, and some experts believe this may have had something to do with his father being a shoemaker. Two other important caveats to this potion are that if Ariel drinks it, she can never be a mermaid again, and if the prince marries someone else, she'll die the next morning. Oh, and once again, she has to pay for the potion with her voice, only instead of it magically floating out of her, the sea witch cuts off her tongue. I know, it's pretty gruesome, but I would have loved to have seen this exchange go down in glorious Disney animation. But at least we got a reference to it with Ursula throwing that tongue in the potion. Now, personally, I don't want anything bad enough to make this exchange. But remember, Ariel is on a quest for a soul. So she drinks the potion, undergoes a very painful transformation, and the prince finds her naked on the shore the next morning. Boy, if I had a nickel every time that happened to me. Here's where being mute, or as the prince would say, being dumb, really screws the mermaid over. Because while he does find her beautiful, he really can't connect with her on a deeper level. A lot of people like to interpret this lack of connection as the prince being an ignorant douche. And while there is definitely some truth to that, I'm here to provide a counter argument. Because not only can the mermaid not talk, she has no idea how the human world works, so the prince is pretty much just taking care of her all day long. As a result, the love that he feels for her ends up being more platonic, like the way a parent feels for their child or how I feel for my dog, as opposed to how a man feels about his wife. The one detail that does rub me the wrong way is that he has Ariel sleep on a big velvet cushion outside of his bedroom door instead of a bed, almost as if he sees her as some kind of exotic pet. But the mermaid doesn't seem to mind. She's just happy to be taken care of. He still takes her with him on all all sorts of adventures like horseback riding and mountain climbing causing her to fall even more in love with him but he just doesn't see her as a potential spouse. Then the worst of her fears comes true. He falls madly in love with a different princess because he mistakes her for being the woman who saved him from drowning. That's got a sting doesn't it? And you may have noticed the similarity with the film where Prince Eric is brainwashed into thinking that Ursula's alter ego Vanessa is the one who saved him. Now we enter the final scene. The prince's wedding and the last day of Ariel's life. And I've gotta say as far as last days go, her sucked. Now, not only is she forced to participate in the man she loves wedding, she also has to dance at the reception, all the while feeling like she's stepping on knives. Fast forward to the end of the night as the festivities calm down and Ariel goes to the edge of the ship to take one last look at the ocean before she dies. And at this moment, she sees her sister swimming to the ocean surface with a potential solution. They tell her they traded their hair to the sea witch in exchange for a magic knife. And if she stabs the prince in the heart and lets his blood drip on her feet, she could become a mermaid again. Here's where things get a little confusing. So buckle up. Ariel is terrified terrified of the nothingness that is the mermaid afterlife and desperately wants to live, but she loves the prince more than she loves herself and can't bring herself to kill him. Instead, she throws the magic knife into the ocean where it dissolves into a red mist and she jumps overboard herself, expecting to dissolve into sea foam. But instead, she feels the heat of the sun and notices hundreds of transparent beings standing around her. They introduce themselves as the daughters of the air. They're ethereal beings who don't have souls, but can earn one through doing good deeds. Yeah, the mythology of the original story is beyond weird, but we've got to accept 
accept it. To put it simply, because Ariel did so many good deeds during her time on Earth, including saving the prince's life and refusing to take it when it benefited her, instead of dying, she became a daughter of the air. If you're wondering what the hell a daughter of the air is, don't worry, because you're not alone and Anderson gives us a brief description. Unseen, we can enter the houses of men, where there are children, and for every day on which we see a good child who is the joy of his parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shortened. The child does not know when we fly through the room that we smile with joy at his good conduct, for we can count one year less of our 300 years. But when we see a naughty or wicked child, we shed tears of sorrow, and for every tear a day is added to our time of trial. In other words, they're angels who are trapped in purgatory until they witness enough children behaving, and then when they do, they're given a soul and can enter heaven. You can think of them as Anderson's way of blackmailing the kids reading his story into not being assholes. And that's it. The story ends with her becoming a daughter of the air, saying goodbye to the prince and his new wife, who have no idea where she disappeared to, and an entirely new adventure starting. Probably not what you expected, but I do like it more than the original ending Anderson planned where the mermaid just dissolved into sea foam and died. In sidebar, this was actually the first draft of the ending that Anderson wrote by hand, and I'm just curious, how the f were people supposed to read this? Now, the final ending isn't exactly a happy one, but it is hopeful. And even though it's surreal in nature, I do think that's a more realistic finale than you typically see in fairy tales. So yeah, that is Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. But we're not done just yet, folks, because we've still got one hell of an analysis section coming up next. So from what I gathered during my research, there are some people out there who absolutely despise this story. And while I do understand their perspective, I do think they should listen to some opposing viewpoints. Because while at first glance, it's a sad story about a poor little mermaid who endured immense pain and sacrificed her life for a man who never loved her in the same way, there is a much deeper meaning under the surface. Because contrary to what the critics like to say, the mermaid didn't risk her life just for the prince, she did it so she could become human and have a soul. In the words of one of our very own solo fan members, it doesn't get much deeper than that. I recently bought this book called The Annotated Classic Fairy Tales, and in it, the author, Maria Tatar, provides an interpretation that empowers the mermaid instead of victimizing her, and I love it. The Little Mermaid's curiosity about human beings draws her to the world of the prince. Fascinated by what is above the surface, by the unknown, and by the forbidden, she shows an investigative curiosity lacking in many fairy tale heroines. She is a creature intent on broadening her horizons. What she sees on Earth stimulates her desire for challenges. She wants a Above all, to explore the world and to discover what is beyond the realm of home. In other words, she isn't so much a victim of the prince's unrequited love as she is an adventurer, and all the risks she takes along the way, while not the most calculated, get her closer to her ultimate goal. Tatar also points out that Ariel was fascinated by humans long before she ever laid eyes on the prince. But because of that intense interaction they had with each other, combined with what her grandma told her about gaining a soul, he became more than just her prince charming. He was her salvation, the person who, despite being totally unaware, could not not only save her from that terrifying nothingness that awaited her at the end of her life, but also invite her into the world that she was so desperate to be part of. I think it's very easy to reach the conclusion that the books Ariel went through some pretty undeserved hardships, but once again, they were voluntary. This wasn't like Cinderella, who was stuck with an abusive guardian, or Snow White, who was also stuck with an abusive guardian. Unlike those heroines, and most of the heroines that we see in fairy tales, Ariel is much more curious, adventurous, free-spirited, and willing to confront what she's afraid of. She wanted to embark on the hero's journey, to experience a life unlike anything she had before, and she paid the price for it. But it is important to mention that Anderson felt he was empowering the mermaid with this ending because she didn't end up having to rely on the prince, but instead, she could rely on herself. He said that he wouldn't accept her getting a soul because someone loves her because that leaves too much of it to chance, and he wanted to permit his mermaid to follow a more natural, more divine path. It is a weird way to think about it, but I kind of like it. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that her punishments weren't excessively brutal. They were, but so are a lot of the trials and tribulations that Anderson's protagonists go through. The most fitting example I can think of is the ugly duckling, who, similar to the mermaid, went through some terrible hardships, and it wasn't until he lost all hope and accepted the fact that he was going to be pecked to death by swans that he realized he had turned into a version of himself that he would be happy with. And that begs the question, why was Anderson and so obsessed with mutability and transformation. Well, as we discussed in my video about the ugly duckling, Anderson considered himself an outsider for seemingly his entire life. As a kid, his family was dirt poor and his interests in the arts led to him being bullied by other kids his age. Because of this, he became laser focused on bettering his position in life. But decades later, when he finally reached the top of the social hierarchy as a world famous and wealthy author, he didn't feel like he belonged there because of his low class upbringing. As someone who dealt with internal struggle and self-hatred his entire life, he would often 
often invoked those same emotions in his protagonists and is even quoted saying that he suffers along with them. In other words, the art embodies the artist, and Little Mermaid does in more ways than one because it may have been written as an allegory for a homosexual relationship that Anderson had. In his book, My Dear Boy, Gay Love Letters Through the Centuries, which is real and not something I made up, Richter Norton says the story may have been written as a love letter to a man named Edward Collin. You see, Anderson sent Collin a copy of the story just after he got engaged, and the letter that goes along with it doesn't leave much to interpretation. Anderson said, I languish for you as a pretty Calabrian wench. My sentiments for you are those of a woman. The femininity of my nature and our friendship must remain a mystery. And he didn't say no homo, so there's only one way to interpret that. Colin wasn't the only man that Anderson had affairs with, though. He also had an emotional and intimate relationship with Carl Alexander, the Grand Duke of this German place. If you're curious, you can read the letters they exchange with each other in the same book, linked below, but they're not pertinent to this story at all. What's important is that Anderson identified as an outcast in some major ways, socially, economically, sexually, and he was tortured by this fact, so he channeled his emotions into his writings. And while there's some people out there who don't like what he made his characters endure, and rightfully so, remember that he went through a form of those very same struggles himself, and similar to his characters, they led to him achieving greatness on a scale larger than he ever imagined. Whew, and that, freaks and geeks, was the messed up origins of The Little Mermaid. So now we're at the point where I've got to ask, what do you think? Did you enjoy the story? Did you hate it? How does it compare to the Disney movie? And how do you feel about Anderson torturing his heroes and heroines? Let me know in a comment down below. And when you're through with that, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe for more content like this delivered to your sub box every week, and share this video with someone or something you know that might like it. And now I've got to give a shout out to this week's sponsor and friend of the channel, Squarespace. You know, there's actually an important detail I left out of today's story. And admittedly, this is kind of a weird place to squeeze it in, but there was another reason the Little Mermaid wanted to become human. As it turns out, there is no internet in the ocean, and after hearing about how easy it is to build a website with Squarespace, she wanted to give it a try. That obviously didn't work out in the end, but let me tell you about what she missed out on. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. They have a massive library of award-winning templates to help you get started. You can buy domains directly from Squarespace so your website has the perfect URL. They automatically generate mobile versions so you don't have to worry about someone on their phone not being able to access your site. As many of you know by now, I use Squarespace to build MessedUpOrigins.com from the ground up and I'm pretty proud of what I was able to do without any coding experience. There's a page where you can learn about and purchase my favorite resources for learning about Disney and folklore history, a link to my merch store where you can buy limited edition solo fan merch, and I just implemented a new page to show off all the fan art the community has sent me. If you want to take the leap and try them out yourself, just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo. Then to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain, use code John Solo at checkout. Another great ad read for another great sponsor. How do I do it? Anyway, on that note, I'm going to bring this episode to a close. Make sure you follow me on social media if you want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, like when the next episode is coming out, and follow Gunther because he's the cutest thing on the goddamn planet. I'll be seeing you guys next week with the first ever episode of Messed Up Murders, working title. Until that day comes, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.